Hey, this is Hey, this is Misery Loves Company, a weekly social reading series hosted by MiseryTourism.com. Every Friday, we welcome outsider and transgressive writers to come and share their work with us. And it's Friday again, so we might as well get going here. Um, first up tonight is Mark. Hey, Mark, how's it going? Hey, William. Uh, it's going pretty well. Uh, I'm happy to make it to the end of the week, uh, and I'm happy to be among outsider writers. Uh, that's a good way to be spending Friday night. Uh, and tonight I'm going to be reading some more poems, uh, from a book that, uh, I just got published my first volume of poetry. Uh, and here is the link to it. Uh, uh, by uh, published by Southernmost Books, and I'm going to be uh, the title of the book is Stills, and I'm going to be reading a few poems from that. The, can you hear me all right? Perfectly, perfectly. Okay, good, good. Uh, let's see, the first poem. Mary and Barb get divorced. The sooty water churns, marbled with foam that reticulates lace. We've been in the water seven minutes. Something like silt or grounds fastens collars around our necks of high black rims, an ashen swipe on Tyler's chin, our faces streaked. The salesman squeezes in, shoving me over a nozzle that gouges a watery jet in my flank. Trying to make a little room, I look up at Tyler, Mary says she doesn't want to drink without booze till she's the hell out of French lick, away from the goddamn smell of sulfur. I rest my head against bullnose cement and close my eyes. The sound of the motor pours in my ears like something wet and breaks up like gravel in the tumble dryer. A bead of moisture trickles down my face. The salesman puts his hand on my shoulder. We've been in the bath long enough. Standing under shower heads, their pale bodies stream grit. Coming here this morning, Mary gets lost in the national forest. She is so upset that we have to stop. I drive to a diner for directions. While I'm inside, Mary puts the top down, walks around to the driver's side and gets in the car. The charcoal leather exhales in sunlight. The red paint, so red, I feel weak. The next poem is titled Broadside. And I'm going to explain a little bit about this poem. Uh, there are a couple of different strands in this poem. One of them have to do, has to do with an event that happened in the late 80s or early 90s where some children in the Bronx uh, were skipping school and they went to the Bronx Zoo, I believe. And there was a dare and on the dare, they all three ended up in the polar bear tank and uh, were killed. This was written about in an essay by Umberto Eco the Italian uh, literary theorist and novelist who wrote The Name of the Rose 
and Foucault's pendulum, uh, among other things. I first read this essay about this event in Umberto Eco's book of essays, How to Travel with a Salmon, and other essays. Another strand of this poem has to do with a man named Arthur Jones. Arthur Jones uh, was born in Arkansas in 1926. He served as a fighter pilot in World War II. Uh, also, uh, he became a big game hunter, trapper, uh, documentarian. Uh, also, he worked as a mercenary when he lived in Africa during the 50s and 60s, uh, trapping and hunting big game, but also working as a mercenary. And later on, he invented the uh, exercise machines that uh, came to be known as Nautilus and became quite rich, uh, one of the richest men in the world, and had a, a very colorful life. Before he became famous, he filmed a, a, a television show about trapping wild animals, uh, which was one of his side businesses, and transporting them to the United States to sell to zoos. Uh, the name of this show is Wild Cargo, and you can see episodes on YouTube. Uh, it's a very low budget 1950s wildlife TV show. Uh, and both of these uh, strands are, are uh, kind of intertwined in this poem. Broadside. The polar bears captured as juveniles during an episode of wild cargo just after the first year of their young lives when they were dependent on the mother for survival along the northern coast of Greenland, yellow now, fully grown, taller than generals, intent on red puncture-proof rubber balls smeared with peanut butter, skidding over simulated ice flows, the bear's condition not that bad, considering humans, maybe they were Puerto Ricans, are harder to digest than fish, even street urchins skipping school, stripped to white cotton brief underwear on a fledgling and untested macho dare beside the tank. Such is the problem with child care in poor ethnic neighborhoods. The director, producer, and star of Wild Cargo, told by a journalist while being interviewed for Playboy magazine, he was rumored to be on the kill list of a third world dictator who possessed hundreds of hours of the filmed expeditions, as well as some natives in prison for having been saved by this white man for whom they'd been working as porters and guides. He says there's no hereafter. What matters? Faster airplanes, bigger crocodiles, and younger women. This doesn't mean soaring rates for jet insurance doesn't have some very far reaching importance or anyone who says he's not afraid looking out a cockpit to see an engine on fire isn't a fool and liar. But walking into a restaurant in Las Vegas to the palpable electric charge in the air as a hundred men turn as one and give a standing ovation to his much younger wife makes it worthwhile. After all, 
To lead the orchestra, you must turn your back on the audience. First course in etiquette. Our heads lolling about, Marie and I come to, squinty-eyed and blinking. We clack through the lobby and out the pneumatic, hermetically sealing, matched, swinging doors. Noonday sun glares from cars parked along the boulevard. It's the first time in our squalid, disposable lives that Marie and I both use our best manners. An offshore breeze kicks up. I lose my footing and stumble. Marie's forest green skirt lashes my face. A paltry average next to a giantess like Marie, I'm very small and strangers stare at us from shady porticos, still and colorless as statues. Great lamps where birds have nested swaying high above. Someone's child loses its way in the hem of Marie's skirt, and I guide it out, my hand on its soft head, The renowned cinematographer shows off on his honeymoon. The rusted sugar mill, the road whereon winds past in lush vegetation, breathes out processed cane, distracting me from the woman sitting beside me who's driving our rental over patchwork asphalt our car tires lick like a pack of dogs, winded after a grueling run. Magnum P.I. was produced here on the island, the ludicrous image of giant Tom Selleck peering over his Ferrari's tiny sloping windshield gives way to thoughts of where this woman and I have been together and where we may yet go each on our own. I could swear off Faye Ray, but that's not been the situation for so long. Anyway, such a flimsy vow, I just concede to a petulant child should reference Johannes Vorster, who had a penchant for the movie of John Ford and thought every movie house in Cape Town showing Ford's flicks seven nights a week, the finest propaganda, kept the natives in line. The sweet, iron-rich air of the mill replaced motor oil from a broken seal, drips to streak the valve cover, burn under red hood. Buttocks and all, or the European bodybuilder. Rocky Kitchen, a dedicated bodybuilding trainee, had plenty of time to visualize his future chest development during the 300-mile round trip he made from Vero Beach three times a week. Several of our staff noticed Rocky was finally getting discouraged and had an idea. The latest European bodybuilding magazine had just arrived. Its cover showed a bodybuilder from the waist up, his hands behind his head. I've got an idea, said one of the staff. We have some photos around here of a pair of heavy set female buttocks, which we were planning on using in a hip slimming article. We can cut out the chest cover and place the buttocks behind the cover where they'll project through. Then we'll make a print of the entire picture 
buttocks and all. The new cover was prepared. The fellows in on the joke were amazed at how real it looked. The European bodybuilder now had the thickest pectoral muscles in history. It makes Ross and Eiferman look like flat-chested girls, somebody said. The big moment arrived. Rocky drove up as usual in the late afternoon. Hey, Rocky, said one of the fellows. We finally got the new chess machine built, and we've been secretly testing it in Europe. Take a look at one of the trainees. Damnation, Rocky replied as he stared at the picture. Those are the thickest pecs I've ever seen. Book me on the next flight to Europe. The last poem is uh, The Galactic Herald of Daedalus goes shopping for an engagement ring and settles on the perverse adolescent genius of the Wenger giant pocket knife. And this begins with a quotation by Werner Heisenberg. The smallest units of matter are not physical objects in the ordinary sense. They are forms, ideas which can be expressed unambiguously only in mathematical language. The silver body paint streaks, excuse me, the silver body paint mother bought and applied to me streaks and runs black. Another needle breaks off deep in my shoulder. The oily suspension requires a bigger gauge. Anyway, mother's no good at injecting. An orange smear where she swabs my arm with a cotton ball. The smell of rubbing alcohol tickles my nose. I'm unsteady on metal casters as mother leads me down the aisle of shadow box displays angled like a saber arch or A-frame overhead, where laid out on green felt Swiss army knives have been mounted according to size, from the larger below to the smaller above. The ones at the apex achieve the sublime, a platonic ideal of the multi-tool. Manifold function distilled to an essence, a question of how you decide between tweezers, a lens, and file, or scissors hook and reamer punch with sewing eye. What algorithmic mystery of usefulness and need the design of each knife suggests. Totally different from the old school analog synth on the counter, Tweak a knob and the sound from one key depressed making sound at a time will change. Could have only one yellowed plastic key with endless dials and buttons to marshal a galaxy of sound. A pistol grip drill in her delicate plump hand. Mother gently revs the motor to spin the chuck her other hand swabbing my temple, she says, now that one is a real gem. Those were great, Mark. I, you know, listening to, listening to you read, it really clicked for me why you decided to call your collection stills, because there's a real photographic quality to these poems, which is to say that you're often like laying out a kind of, um, oh my gosh, what's the word I'm looking for? There's like an observational quality here where it's like you're looking at a scene and your eye is kind of moving across the scene and across all the different objects in the scene. And like there's a, not a lot of overt interpretation on the surface anyway going on in the poems themselves. Instead, it's more like you, you're you laying out this kind of scene for the, the reader and 
then the reader, like the interpretive weight is put on the reader, which is, I think, really fascinating. But my favorite of these, and I think the one that kind of undermines that or subverts that, and I think uh, in a clever way, is the... Um, is your the penultimate poem that you read about the bodybuilder with the with and the and the photograph that you know where his pecs are replaced with with a photo of a woman's butt and like that <laughs> yes because there's like you're giving the game away there right like the there's the illusion of objectivity there's a when you look at a photograph there's the illusion that you're looking at a moment of objective life captured in a neutral way but in reality in almost every instance there have been all of these conscious and unconscious choices made about lighting about framing and even like instances of outright fucking manipulation like the one you're describing there and i think that's a really i'm not sure where that's placed within your collection but i think it adds a great interpretive kind of wrinkle to the other poems because it encourages the reader to then say, oh, wait a second, I need to go back and look at these other poems that seem so detached and so neutral and see like where the artist may be, may be playing with me a little bit. And it's, I don't know, it's really great, Mark. I enjoyed them a lot. Well, thank you, thank you. I agree with everything uh, you said. Um, you know, you're absolutely right uh, about the title. Um, and how, you know, the, the poems have like this photographic scene, imagery, or ab aspect to it. And there is the illusion of objectivity, right? And, and that's completely, like, I'm completely aware of that. And, and you know, it's like, I don't uh, aspire to this idea, or even try to put it over on the reader. It's like, yeah. oh, you know, I'm, I make no uh, claims to objectivity. And, you know, one of the things, you know, sometimes I've uh, heard other people talk about David Foster Wallace as a descriptive writer. And, you know, one of the things he talks about in the, when he talks about writing descriptively, laying out a scene in kind of a very imagistic way, is that, you know, even by describing something, you are kind of, you know, making a privileged choice. It's like it's no longer a completely objective, you can't Absolutely. have purely objective description, right? Right. Um, and yes, uh, I do think that that poem about buttocks, you know, with its sort of crude humor, uh, sort of, you know, it adds a wrinkle and reminds the reader that, you know, this isn't completely, there's not a, there, there shouldn't be assumed the illusion of objectivity. Right. Or at least that it is an illusion, right? And I think that having moments like that in a poetry collection are great because they they kind of encourage the reader to go back and review the poems they've already read through a different interpretive lens. So I, I don't know. I think it's pretty cool, Mark. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Thank for you. Man. Yeah. And up next is, is the wartime author himself, Derek Maine. Hey, Derek, how's it going? Good, man. How's my sound? Your sound is beautiful, my man, my friend. I put the link in the chat. All right. I'm going to read. I'm going to read from July from the wartime author. Obviously, they're. I mean, this shit. Listen. I'm writing it live. You know what I mean? It's unfolding live. There's a real world out there. This is a. Uh, I was lucky enough to get this published in Elizabeth Ellen's Hobart in September. We're just right behind. We're just right behind. But I don't think I read. I had to look. I'm old and often. I had to look to see if I, I haven't read this. June 30th, 2023. The 1980s called and they want their foreign policy back. Well, I mean, you know what? I don't always title them, but this was a significant 
July. You know, this was a significant. So I did title this one. I forgot that. This is Bombs Bursting in the Air from New York to the Crystal Coast with the wartime author. June 30th, 2023, the 1980s called and they want their foreign policy back because the Cold War has been over for 20 years. Obama said this to Mitt Romney during a presidential debate in whatever year that would have been, a possible epigraph to an impossible war. I'm sunbathing in a chase lounge, cigarillo in hand, orange soda, no thoughts of the war or New York, the damned diversion of alone again or playing on several stations at once. July 2nd, 2023. I'm lonely and traveling with a fully stocked medicine cabinet for ailments at any hour, plus a generous CIA weed supply, courtesy of a strip mall in Elizabeth, New Jersey. You've never seen such trash, such an ugly empire in ruins, such a wretched, diseased people popping polyps in the street, divided highway, ash and smoke and smoke and ash. The moon is enormous tonight over Long Island and southern tip of the Hamptons, practically. Today, I glimpsed the women barefoot selling sliced mangoes on I-95 at the foot of the George Washington Bridge cusp of America's birthday. One entire clonazepam, one joint, one gummy, and I feel afloat, entirely awake in these dead hours. It is rural here, very much so. There are wine tours and farm stands. The beaches are further down. There are manicured backyards and chase lounges by the pool, smoke from Canada still, a kind of silence, a certain implication hanging in the air always. The Bradley graveyards, I'm hearing whispers. This is especially true of literature where the real time is independent of the apparent and where many dead men are our grandchildren's contemporaries. Ezra Pound. Literature happens all at once. In the 20th century, Bertrand Russell sent T.S. Eliot's wife silk undergarments. At Seward Farm on Abinger Common in the Surrey Hills, he took her as a lover. It was a brief affair. July 3rd, 2023. On the 4th of July at the southern tip of the Hamptons, practically, America celebrates her freedom with a colorful show of fake bombs bursting in air. The war we fund in Europe, the civil war in the Middle East, the rising threat of China, the sea level besides. We stand in unison, hat over heart, and bless our luck to have other bodies fight our wars. July 4th, 2023. Literature is happening all of the time, all around us, all at once. We've set course for the Hamptons in the top down beige 92 E30. The drift from the city won't reach us here. I'm not liable to be photographed. I don a pair of Gulchi and Cabana sunglasses just in case. The temperature is the sound of frogs by the creek. My hair is all frizzy, matted down uselessly. Runaway by Del Shannon, playing on repeat. It smells like rotted cheese on the road to the Hamptons. No one tells you this. It was a year of dissonance and distrust. The year of distance and disregard. July 6, 2023. We are all pieces of one consciousness. Our time, talents, and energy multiple. then sending our signals through time and space for the next people, the wanderers on this dying, lonely, unvisited planet sitting beneath a sun set to explode like a time bomb. I wrote the above inside a porter potty stuffed with blood-soaked tampons and cheeseburger wrappers, six gallons of unflushed piss and human excrement, and the phone number for a Catherine, sharpied on the blue plastic interior, who apparently handles the blowjobs around here at the public public lot in Punkock Beach. There is ample evidence that God is everywhere and even visits us from time to time. I sat on the rocks watching the boats come in and made certain decisions about my life. There are hot dog trucks all over the Long Island Expressway. Every exit, both ways. Can laborers. Fridays were always busy. In the late sunlight, top down, E30, with Prada sunglasses speeding between the farms and the sea on the road to Montauk, I resolve an issue with the purpose of consciousness and devise a theory of art as necessary salvation. I came back to the southern tip of the Hamptons practically to understand the purpose of my... Setting me down on this path in one of his last interviews. 
and to understand my particular role in this great untangling, I see that now. July 7th, 2023, I never made it to New York. July 8th, 2023, we are releasing cluster munitions. The museum director warned of a looming munitions crisis. I was an ammunition officer, he reminds the Laurel Room. July 23rd, 2023, the president of Belarus is joking about letting the Wagner Group loose in Portland. Poland. <laughs> Imagine the Wagner Group loose in Portland. Oh, my God. I'm hiding out from the war and the publicists and lawyers and a crumbling estate and a fallen empire at the Islander Motel Quad Espresso Pineapple Vape. My spat and skin seep into the air folds of the luxurious, wasteful, ice-cold air conditioning of the Islander Motel, waiting for the bar to open, studying maps and cluster munitions, casualty counts. I am being ignored by the mainstream media. I am a leper, a black sheep, a ne'er-do-well. They don't know what to do with me. This morning, even, iced coffee, rose matcha, microdose psychosyllabin, the women and the daughters eating out of my hand. They've never seen the likes of me in this town. I'm waiting for the bailman to bring up my typewriter. I am muddying to myself and missing the page and all this waiting, all this dullness, all this waiting dullness and pain. I cannot write the war until this porter arrives. It is an electric, a good model. I travel lightly. He is taking a sweet ass time. I met a woman in the deserted ballroom earlier sometime before lunch, pimento cheese tea sandwiches on the veranda overlooking the swells. She asked me to come see her again tonight when it's later. I'm always waiting for it to be later. And I'm still waiting on my goddamn typewriter. Where are the go-getters in this town? Who is working their way up? I have thousands and thousands of dollars, mostly in poker chips and first edition novels, all written by dead drunk losers, geniuses all, in an unmarked storage facility in Pofftown, North Carolina, $15 a month. I need, for the purposes of this project, a more thorough education on psychosyllabin mushrooms. I walk up and down the beach looking for my dealer. He assures me he is in a white cutoff Big Johnson t-shirt and is surrounded by a harem of twice to thrice divorced registered nurses and thongs and butterfly tattoos. I sense he is trawling in the deep end. My calves hurt. I turn around deterred and sober. This was before lunch. This was before Poland. It was too hot to nap. I got up, got dressed, and walked down to the surf shop to buy some plaid. It might be the hottest day of the year today, but soon it will be the fall and the war, and I refuse to be out of fashion or out of time. I need to look the part. I feel good. The vapors are flowing through me undetected. It's California street plaid or nothing for me. I get back to the room and switch to polo. Dior would be wasted on the Crystal Coast, I've come to realize. From the next room, I hear the modern lovers, Pablo Picasso. A 100-year-old Henry Kissinger is visiting China, a 14-hour flight, a handshake agreement, an accounting error, a gross miscalculation, an understatement, a century between us. Now, too, certain measures, proactive, a productive meeting between counterparts of foreign lands, all enemies, foreign and domestic. The call is coming from inside the house. The cluster munitions are evidence of a war crime. 123 nations are signatories and members of the Convention on Cluster Munitions, an international treaty drafted in Dublin in 2008 and signed in Oslo just six months later. The United States is a member. China is not a member. Russia is not a member. The cutlery of a place is something I pay special attention to. The cutlery and the lighting. I've made mention before of the situation with the lighting and it being very important. Days like this, I could write a war and yet other days I do. There is no entertainment yet as immersive, intimate as literature. Immediate too, hopscotching as it does through time and space, mimicking and mocking an eternity. No one talks like this. They should. The vibes must be immaculate. I am a tuning fork. There is a war going on here. A woman two spots ahead of me in the buffet line is making eyes. What a century we've arrived at. The stench of the public pool cost me an hour and a half, half a can of gold bond powder and all the hot water on the third floor for hours, well into the evening. The sun is relentless today, unforgiving, cruel. It pounds and pounds at pounds of miserable flesh and skin suits sauntering on the sand. The sand entered us through the cracks in exchange. How many days is it until cocktail hour? I feverishly ask the glowing beast in the sky. The sun sags, saps all of us. Afternoons take several lifetimes to pass. Children here learning to smoke cigarettes. 
Teenagers fill carts with cyanide. They come for you twice here and from every direction. This is not Montego Bay. There are no places to hide. Poolside, I inhale the news of Linda and Steve's messy divorce and all those gorgeous plates, berry-flavored gelato oil off-market, a hint of smoke from Canadian wildfires and cheese it and goldfish powder. I count the blues and the greens. The Mexicans won't stop feeding the pigeons. I'm surrounded by aunts on vacation, crushing unlimited margaritas over crushed ice styrofoam. We get the oysters side, peel and eat shrimp, the butter sauce, squeeze lemon, a song from under the floorboards by magazine comes on, is turned up. The young ladies tending the bar at the fish hut grill and their runners are devastatingly hot and finely tuned to kill. Every summer, man snaps after a few midday painkillers and proposes, sometimes in front of his wife. Red-faced from the drink, wrinkly from the sun, leathered and slathered with Old Spice, crisp hundreds falling out of his pocket, a regional sales manager, an international playboy in his mind. Failing and flailing and falling to his knees at the sight of the bar wrenches. July 24th, 2023. The Loblolly Pine Forest line the southern coast, power lines, chemical weapons, word of God. I woke up in a whole new century. Odessa has been hit hard every night since Russia pulled out of a grain deal. Two drones crashed near the Ministry of Defense in Moscow. The hit by Daughters plays. Man, the that Israeli was... hostages free plan. Sorry, man, I interrupted you a little bit there. Man, that was fucking awesome. I, I, man, it is so fascinating what you're doing with this project because it, especially to have you read a piece like this, that because there's a little bit of a publication lag here, right? Usually when you've read from wartime author, you've read pieces that you had like just recently published in your sub stack. And so we're like, you know, memorializing the week before or a couple of weeks before. But this is last summer. And to see, well, this summer, I don't know, is it this summer or last summer? But either way, like this is the most recent summer. And it's 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 in such a weird place, right? Because it's just far enough away that it doesn't feel immediate right but it's not far enough away to have become history and so to to see it presented as history is really fucking fascinating and you really in a number of beautiful passages here like perfectly captured the vibe of last summer man i love the references to the smoke in the air the smoke still being in the air and how much of the summer it felt like that smoke was just there just kind of ever present um there's so many great lines here though i love this was before lunch this was before poland because yeah sure that's a callback to earlier in that section but it's also like for a piece about war like for a work in pro progress novel about war is there any like more perfect line than that because you immediately like your brain goes back to like world war ii and how that was like the in that was the ultimate instigating incident that tur turned it to a hot war, right? The invasion of Poland. And like to have that appear here in the midst of this like holiday domestic scene, like the way you've interwoven like the, the multiple strands of this piece is fascinating to me. The way you've interwoven the, um, the like weird simultaneous like urgency and distance of the war happening somewhere else happening in ukraine with the other weird w mix of urgency and distance like of like day-to-day -day domestic life going on a vacation with your family and all of the like the weird small little like momentary crises and psychological hiccups and stuff that come with that and that i don't know that contrast is just i think really fucking effective i will say just one more thing i love the it was a year of dissonance and distrust the year of distance and disregard because somehow that 
that really captures 2023 for me. I've been thinking, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. I guess it's a little early to be reflecting back on the year since it's only October, but I have been anyway. And this really feels like a year of alienation to me personally. Like it feels like a year where people have become more and more atomized, like yeah, nationally and internationally, but also like just in the interpersonal relationships I'm aware of, there's this real tremendous sense of people just like sort of drifting apart and and withdrawing into their own, withdrawing into themselves, you know, and uh Anyway, I'm rambling, but I think you really cat. What I'm trying to say is, you've really captured the vibe of this moment in history remarkably well, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I, the only thing I want to add, add, which is awesome, I, that you said. I I'm thinking about lately. If anybody's ever listened to the history of Rome, the podcast from many years ago, that's that's excellent. Um, I've, I've mentioned it multiple times to William and Try, but it's something I, I listened to many many years ago before podcasts were kind of anything, and and um. I really specifically remember these time periods that you're taught throughout history are so much longer than you imagine. You said yeah. World War II, right? World War II is like a term we use. World War I wasn't a term, obviously. It's the Great War, you know what I mean? Because two hadn't happened yet. It is going to be such a blink of time before mm -hmm. one to the 20th century. Oh, I think you froze up. Are all one thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's true. I mean, if you think about it in terms of empires and eons, what's a hundred years? If I were to say, well, what was what was happening in 300 AD, you know? Yeah. It's just, it, it's just, we live in the hundred years that changed more than probably any hundred year period. Hmm. But when you zoom out on what a hundred years is in terms of geopolitical conflict, it's nothing, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. In the same pat, it's interesting that you like mentioned the fall of Roman stuff because you do see like the same patterns we, we like reproduced endlessly. Like how many barbarian invasions were there before Rome finally actually fucking fell, like truly fell. It, that was like a slow, decrepit, like gradual loss of territory over time. Right. That wasn't like one day Rome's there, the next day the empire is gone. Right. It, it's like a slow erosion where you see the same international um, crises play out again and again in slightly different forms. But we're we are at a point where now, like you know, when you read something that happened from the summer, and I'm the same way. Like that feels so long ago. You know what I mean? Mm. Anyway, that's, thank y'all so much. Actually, true. Um, you know, like the cycle of history, like the cyclical nature. It seems like the cycles are getting like closer. I guess, or you know, there's less time between them. So I, I don't know weird it's kind of like um i don't know but i really like um i wanted to say i, I like that cluster munitions montage uh that's uh kind of juxtaposed with the dinner table thing that the dinner table etiquette that part is really fucking sick thank and you also, i think i might have tripped over my words I, that there's three that are not signatories and those three are us russia and china. us russia and china yeah yeah, yeah. That, you know, I, I really like how that fits into like because it's like you know like the dinner etiquette you're talking about the cutlery and all the other shit like that's just so perfect like a perfect segue into <laughs> and i guess um i also like the del shannon too a wah, 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 wah. she ran away that song yeah. is so punk too for it, like it's time <laughs> <laughs> it is yeah. it's wild all right. Thank you, Derek. And Rudy, you might as well keep your mic, mic unmuted because you are up next. Roger. Um, I'm going to read some more from uh, Game Loop here. Uh, before I do, uh, I might read another poem. So if people just want to throw in, um, or if anybody wants to pick like a playing card, no jokers, uh, just a standard, you know, ace through king, any set or whatever, I don't care. Uh, but yeah, I'll start uh Three of clubs, Michael says. Okay. 
I'll check that one and then I'll read whatever poem that is at the end. Oh, yeah, let me see here. Yeah, so this one is called Under Siege. This one is about a uh, a video game that's basically, a, I believe it's a Syrian propaganda game um, that's uh, pro-Palestinian, anti-Israel. Um, it's called Under Siege. While I've never played this sequel to a propaganda game described by Wikipedia as America's Army but Not Free, I've heard you can throw rocks against Israeli tanks and watch them bounce. Poco, 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 poco. Syrians lined up double quick to get this one. So it moved thousands of units as if it were a version of Benjamin Netanyahu, who was really into total war instead of being really into total annihilation of Gaza. Stripped down the political. And it's just another FPS with too many cut scenes. Scene cut. You're a Palestinian kid named Ani. Talking shit on Counter Strike 1.6 when they drop the Moab on you. Kill streak, prestige, camo gun skin, flayed bodies in the street, humanitarian corridor shooter, people on Twitter showing pictures of this dead kid and parading around his YouTube channel, raising him to posthumous meme status, status games we play. Honestly, little Ani was 12, and if I was in a lobby with him, it wasn't a hospital lobby. I would absolutely say slurs back while he spits his juice at the screen and talks about fucking my mom in Arabic or whatever scratches his itch. Itch.io's developer page for Under Siege has a comment that links to a video and links up a lot of my feelings on war and peace. There are mod of Under Siege like cheat menu. You can fly and shoot unlimited and each other. I'm imagining Ani gets those cheats as a 12-year-old martyr flying around and through checkpoints, through soldiers who harassed him, making them shiver, their 13th intifada this week, occupying the same space as those heroes on Afghan rugs. No, not magic carpets. Okay, maybe magic carpets. Uh, this one is called Night in the Woods. Uh, it's about the game Night in the Woods. Uh, let's see. Okay, JT, I apologize for saying this game was trash and or a cash-in on 20-somethings depressive episodes. Since I paid cash, what amounts to less than a penny for a bundled copy, I still wish it was a dirtier mirror. I wish it traced my college dropout experience with more precision, but it's easy to overlay on May Borowski, like a favorite cat sleeping in your bed, feelings of terror as you crush her small body in the arms of sleep. And obviously, the goth alligator would get it there. I made it dirtier. Uh, this one's called Sonic the Hedgehog. The worst part is the labyrinth. Elevator sound announcing impending George Floyd on my black and blue coated little friend who cares for me like a good sheepdog from the past. Past Act 1 and 2. Crawling colors. Green and brown are the colors of ivy on brick. One mortar, worries sent back from the future me. Swept up in the turbulence, hands in the air, please shoot. Shoots and ladders, games with the neighbor girl aren't this nerve-wracking. Cue intense music, cues missed. Slap the umbilical that connects me to this world underwater. Slap my own face. I have no patience for the bubble. This is a good time. Everything riding on one ring. Autism is something unnamed in the tongues of men or elves. And uh, let me check the three of clubs here. I, this might be one I've already read. If it is, I'll read it again, I guess. Uh, let me see. Do, 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 do. I have these organized by... Uh, oh, actually, this isn't one I read, so I'll read it. This is called The Company of Myself. It's uh, based on a Flash game called The Company of Myself uh, that deals with... Uh, I guess depression and hobos, which is pretty cool. Spent a lot of time on Congregate during the dumb, dumbing solitude of my early adulthood. Youthful obsession with weird mechanics constantly being peaked in the indie hotbed of the early aughts. A bed I wanted to sleep soundly in, be tucked gently into. A bed I wanted to saw apart with a fucking chainsaw, John Denver style. 
after facing alienation and general apathy and major quickishness and private ceaseless longing in the spectrum fueled arms race that was TIG source forums. Speaking honestly, I respect a lot of the designers of that era. Jason Rohrer's work definitely threw me for a loop, as did Elliot Pilanens, the company and myself, which iterated on a mechanic and linked it to a character that I could see myself in, a hobo using their mistakes as jumping off points. Score one for hope, I guess. I know it was nice to see a shaggy vagrant get a lift, a boost, after I myself wandered aimlessly creatively homeless among the sharp spikes of San Francisco. And that's it. Man, these are awesome, man. I, so I, I see that you, you've then started them by, um, by cards, by suit and rank, which is cool. Yeah. That's, yeah. Man, that's, that's awesome. I actually, <laughs> man, I, 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 it's hard for me not to want to talk about the under siege one. That's def given <laughs> given current events. That one definitely. That one is actually a new one I wrote basically today. I saw. Um, I know you. I linked you to that uh, article that had the kid. That yeah, the, article. the a streamer tweet, right? who was killed by an airstrike, or yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah that's what it was about. So that's a new one. I I don't know. Man, this is. It's it's great. I love the way, I, man. I love the way you describe the game it itself in this one. Like how you, it's funny. Like how propaganda, how how like art propaganda, any form of art propaganda is handled, right? Because there. Because it's invariably bad on a technical level. And just by the way you describe this game, you could tell this game, regardless of like how you feel about Israel versus Palestine, this game is obviously a poorly made game. It obviously doesn't have a huge amount of technical merit or offer a huge amount of fun. So then you have to like find that value in the propaganda itself, like in the message of the game, which is really a really like weird and fascinating way to have to process art, right? It's so it's so alien, but also like it can deliver the feels nonetheless, right? Like if you that want is. to. And but it, it provides a kind of frustrated fantasy, I think, that you kind of get at here where it's like, man, on some level, like you really want the opportunity to like throw rocks at an Israeli tank <laughs> only in a virtual space. Right. But then yeah. because that virtual space is like executed in a, in a technically incompetent way, it's this weird <laughs> kind of like blue balls cock block situation right where you're like man i have this fantasy and then you go to live it out and it's like oh but this game is broken <laughs> and i love how you capture that here but i love that you then from there pivot to an actual human story and interwi interweave it excuse me with your own life in a really fascinating way and interweave like your own relationship with video games with that of this kid who like had dreams of being a of being a streamer who had dreams of doing this shit yeah. and whose life was just fucking annihilated at 12 and like also given like it makes a lot of sense within this larger series of poems that you're creating too because so many of these poems are about like the contrast between the fantasies of adolescence and the like bleak demoralizing realities of adulthood and so, so to have this story about this kid who like will only ever have lived in one of those two worlds is I think really appropriate. Yeah, I uh said I went I they were uh showing his channel and stuff on Twitter. I made a post to say, Oh, he you know, this is some kid who was killed in a strike, you know, he only want he, they it's a weird tweet because they said he only wanted a hundred K subscribers. You know, this was his dream to have hundred K. I was like, damn. Like hundred K, that's mood. a lot of <laughs> big mood, right? <laughs> like I wish I could have a hundred K subscriber. But no, I so um I went to his channel and you know there's like a, a video of him playing uh CS one point six with like him and his friend in a death match and he's like counter terrorists and they're the terrorists 
And, uh, you know, it's just like shit like you would see, like some couch multiplayer shit that you know, see. Uh, shit like I remember, you know, as a kid. You know, there's this sense of like, um, I guess like, yeah, you know, he's dealing with the reality of war and stuff like that too, you know, so, but that's, that's the magic carpet line. It's like, well, you know, you on one hand, you have, you know, people, you know, he's, this kid is like basically memorializes a martyr or whatever now, but, you know, you also have this sense that, you know, he's still is a kid you know, playing video games. So right, it's like, right. It's like, yeah, you know, yeah, you kind of, it's both worlds, like you said, type of deal. Yeah. Oh, man, it's, it's great. It's good shit, as usual, man. Thanks so much. And Michael's up next. Cool. Hang on one sec. Yeah. Cool. Um, let me just... Uh... Fetch the Google Doc. <laughs> so this is actually a revised version of um, something. I think it was like the first or second time I ever came to MLC was to read this poem. I think that's it. There we go. So yeah, there's probably an ancient YouTube recording of an earlier version of this poem. Um, cool. So I wrote this uh, in May 2020. Um, this was just sort of like, I'd spent most of that spring just like writing a lot of poetry for the first time in a while. And this was sort of like the, the biggest and the longest one I wrote at the time. It's called Plague City Symphony. One, Allegro. I need a cure for this 2020, so I hit the quarantine streets with a loose face mask, a fistful of bitcoins, a suppressed cough, a rejected novel, a bag of Skittles, and an alibi for why I'm not cowering at home. My first stop is a monster selling monster by the gallon, paid with quarters, rolled beneath a plastic barrier. Tonight, I'm cashing in all my bodega credit. Every Lucy is a torch in the endless cave, and I'm just trying to get... Across the street, I'm almost run over by a frantic ambulance as it dashes on an empty stomach. Its engine heart about to burst hours from now. Its driver will return home too anxious to hug a child who learns about the world through a thumb-blooded screen. A woman reaches out on the corner of 9th and 4th, asking me why the hospital stole her husband, why he had to die alone, a ventilator his sole witness to God's plan. There must be a plan, she says to me. I leave what coins I carry, a moment when distancing must be ignored. And then my frantic feet fall down to hell, down to the viral hotspot where a northbound subway drags a dozen coffins behind. And me, cure hunter, quarantine breaker, just waiting for a heart attack shaker. I'm here for the fallen iPhone, the missing Pokemon, the thing we scream about when we scream about love. At the end of the line, we riders and survivors are instructed to exit, told to return to the surface. And that's just the damn thing. The title's symbolic, but the outcome symphonic. I'm here to follow musicians who stayed in New York for the love of guitars and guzangs while soulless feet knock their change jars askew. Listen now. The unseen music of apocalypse haunts the underground. The demon subway lurching out of sight. Number two, Adagio. There's a place where the river hits the bay. And the water shudders in the moonlight just that way. Like it's meant to be. Just for you. The oil slick symbolism of it. Like an open mic poem read by a stranger who just nails it. Just howls it like you never could. Like they know how to carve new verbs out of a thousand year old language like aerogel. Like they were born to remind you of your infancy. Oh, to not have to wait all night for the words to find you by the shore. After calling for hours. Begging. Just to know the shape of their name. To feel them hold you beneath the water and drown you, if that's what it takes to experience it, just this once. Ah, but for all the world's curses, its cracked daggers and its plagues, sometimes the words do come. They reach out. They call your name. They promise you a cure. They pull you from the river, put dry clothes on your back and whisper in pulses through the chambers of your water-choked heart. 
follow me. Number three, Scherzo. The brick tunnel ends at a half-open door. I hiss the password. Vaccine down slick steps into the throb of an unlicensed rave. A symphony of a thousand. Party like there's no health insurance. A bailout of the city's last souls. Neon poison sold at the bar in clear, classic red plastic. My paper rejected, body ejected into the methane mass, the final orgy of a dying globe, the deep heat blasted atmosphere. I survived these manic inflamed lungs to ask, aren't you people worried about getting sick? They reply, New York's rapid heart choir. Fuck it, the world's already ending. It already was before the virus arrived. And then everything goes chromatic and the music rips me apart. Endless flechettes instead of music. My last thought, is that Auden was half right. We must love one another, but we're still going to die. Number four, Sonata. I need a cure for this 2020, so I locate the nearest hospital and ask for a bed and a saline drip. Sorry, you're out of network, they tell me. A terminal patient named Joe proffers nicotine and says he wheels himself outside every morning to take in what might be his final dawn light. It's a habit of beginnings, he tells me. I miss my children, he tells me. And I think of family 200 miles north. A secret disease that might mean I won't get to say goodbye. Five blocks from home, a station wagon flashes danger at a steep and lonely intersection. A woman and a man beg for relief from gravity. Their bodies steal against the wagon's rust-chewed rear to hold back the crush of the world. Don't ask me why I tug my mask over my mouth and join them, where they open a space, and together we push with everything we have and ever will. A baby wails like a busted siren in the back seat, while a toddler laughs and fiddles with the steering wheel, this next generation blind to the dead battery truths that stalk them. But we climb against this agony of weight, until at last the street reveals some level truth, a place to stop and think. We grasp greedily for our masks, every breath a gift in the cool and windless Brooklyn air. Then we remember ourselves and cover our faces again. A wayward taxi stops and offers us a jump. Soon there's wind and sun as the car phoenixes up Fifth Avenue. We break protocol on my doorstep, shake each other's hands, and then they're gone. And I watch green parrots serenade for mates beyond Greenwood spires. My sleepless body aches like it needs to molt. I check my pockets for what remains. I spent my last Bitcoin on an egg, bacon, and cheese, and I lost the Skittles on a far-flung subway bench. The cough persists, and my novel remains rejected. Have I lost my alibi? I dig out receipts, napkins, scraps, that bear the second and third stanzas of poems misplaced along the way. I know there's an ending here, a symbol, something about human connection, right? I look up, the new day's searing blue, the final stars lost to sleep, as the city's living music crescendos and its soul reaches for resolution. So that's it. That was fantastic, Michael. I do remember you reading a version of this, but as you said, it was a long, long time ago. I really dig this piece. I really love the way this poem ends, by the way. And I think like that final stanza really helps this piece transcend like the be become something more than just like a poem written during the pandemic right because there's that real hint of there's it really captures that feeling that i remember having you know in in early 2021, you know, after the vaccines came out, where it's like, oh, it's over, but but what the hell? Like, what did it mean? What did any of that mean? And I, you do a great job throughout this piece of really capturing that sensation of like, there's something apocalyptic happening, right? Like that there's, this truly feels in some weird way, like, not only like the end of the world, but like something otherworldly, something supernatural, like 
And I, I remember in those early days of the pandemic, there was that real sensation of like, like the fundamental logic of life had been ripped apart in some way. And there was this kind of, and so everything felt surreal. And you really capture that extremely, extremely, extremely well in this poem. But I do love that you arrive at that moment of like, instead of it being a truly apocalyptic poem that ends with a sense of finality, it ends exactly how the pandemic did, which is with a sense of real confusion, like a return to normalcy that like affirms the fact that nothing was coming to the to an end, but also doesn't offer any kind of interpretive lens through which to view the last year of like bizarre trauma so it's it's a really it's a really excellent poem i think and it's good to hear it again it's especially good to hear it again now a couple of years removed from its writing because it, it lends so much more perspective to it anyway thanks man thanks for letting me read it i appreciate that yeah absolutely um and i've lost the list there's the list cat is up next hey um so do you remember like an hour and a half ago when you were talking about the zoom trolls and how they left because you were talking about staring down the barrel of 40 i'm accidentally like reading something that's kind of just about that um so this is called driving with jason driving with jason started to make me uncomfortable not for the reasons you think though not because he was twice my age or how he looked at me at stoplights not getting breakfast together on Sundays, what people must have thought of me beside him in a diner, beaming in his big flannel. Their assumptions mattered little to me. They weren't my business. Maybe it made him feel good to have me there, young and dumb enough, but that didn't matter either. We were even in my bed once. Nothing weird happened. We watched Princess Mononoke. We hugged goodbye at the door. I curled back in my blankets, heard the elevator slither past me in the wall. But he understood too much. Too much was the same. Too much in his eyes. Face to face in those bars, I almost couldn't do it. I'd never known someone over 40 with eyes like that. Still sad and wet, no crust on them. When I imagined myself in my 40s, those eyes were not a possibility. I'd have the eyes of a snake or a worn toy plush, these hard knowing marbles. I didn't want to think about being that old with those eyes, that old with no calluses, still getting drunk with near strangers in cemeteries and falling asleep in my jeans. On Super Bowl Sunday, we got Waffle House and he drove us to Morgantown the long way. Joints in the glove box, passenger seat, paper bag, whiskey, mountain curve so sharp even he got lost. I picked the music, it was Mitski the whole way down. Then an hour from home, sitting in the Mexican restaurant, my newly ex-boyfriend texted to insist I had made a mistake, asking to talk things over. Jason went to the bathroom and came back without advice. He watched me stare into my drink as it watered down. In the car, I ranted in circles. He said things like, that's how it goes, and then dropped me off. In bed that night, I wanted nothing more than comfort, but I knew then what I wanted was impossible. After that, Jason and I didn't go any farther than Butler County, and one day he stopped picking me up. Um, so that's that. And I've been trying to write, like, cause that's an older one, but I've been trying to write, like, shorter poems because I really admire the, like, I don't know. I like to ramble, but I want to master that like mic drop thing. So I don't know. There's a couple shorter poems here. You can be the judge on if that actually worked or not. But this one's called Past Life Regression. I'm back in that stupid room with no windows waiting to be retrieved for my phone to light up at 11 p.m. with a text from you asking if I'm up, asking what I'd do if you were in my room right now. I'm up. I'm stepping toward you out of the ensuite wearing nothing but rose-colored glasses. This time I'm not letting you take them off. Um, this one's called Fighting Over the Piano. Um, it's about when I was in high school. I didn't have a piano, but I like really wanted to play. And the auditorium in my high school had like, like there was time in the morning before school started where you could like sneak in and use it. And there was like a guy there who was always using it. So we always had to like try to get there first. Um, so I was obsessed with him, obviously. Um, so this is about that. Self-taught, he moved like his hands were missing bones, rubbing up against the limits of my knowledge, the rigid shapes I'd perfected through years of lessons, reams of gold star stickers and songbooks, those goddamn mnemonic devices. Every good boy does fine, but it's a problem. 
You never hear a grace note. Nothing coils up inside you like a clef around the G. I suddenly started to hate all that I'd learned. Now I wanted him to put me in a blindfold, force me to make new shapes with my hands. And then I have one more, which is kind of old, but I've since edited it. And it's about like, um, I guess like trying to balance the internet idea of people that you admire, but also like in this space, you kind of know them. Um, so it's called Subtweet. One of my favorite writers unfollowed me on Twitter today. I'm living in the real world. I'm supposed to concern myself only with real things and the opinions of real people. I'm not supposed to notice this or get upset, but here I am, noticing and feeling upset. If you knew I was writing this right now, being such a piece of shit in this poem, sitting here with chicken wing on my face and listening to Creed on Spotify like a piece of shit, he would laugh at me. He would tweet something like, imagine feeling sad that someone pressed a button on a website and felt a sudden fleeting urge to lie down in traffic. You know, Imagine having personal feelings about a set of words on a screen and felt deeply pathetic. He'll never read this poem, though. He'll go on living his life with no knowledge of me saying these things. My favorite writer, the offline. My favorite writer, the normal guy with boundaries. Turns off his phone when he goes to work. Behind the bar, he doesn't see me crawling through his phone screen, swiping at his ankles with my flaccid wireframe hands. It's not even a little breeze. He's not like, hmm, what was that? My hands are just not there to him. Can I get you another one of those? He sang to someone who isn't me, a real person in the real world. I take her seat, we overlap. My ass is her ass and nobody feels a presence. I reach for her drink, but the glass phases through my palm. And that's all I got. Yeah, those were fucking fantastic. I have to, I have to say though, that first poem made me feel real bad. <laughs> no, but sorry, I'm not really that sorry, but I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I I there's something wonderful about the like a particular kind of emotional resonance of that poem that the weird sense of like nostalgia but nostalgia seen forwards and backwards at the same time if that makes sense like imagining yourself being old imagining yourself being young again and that and you really get at the the weird tension i think of aging because it's never a simple thing it's never a simple uncomplicated process where you're young and then you're old as much as i like to bitch about how old I am and how old I feel because you're constantly, even as you age, you're constantly, you have these moments, these momentary like fleeting like uh, seconds where like your synapses will fire in a weird way and you'll feel like you did when you were 13 or you'll feel like you did when you were 24. And it's always so weird and so awkward when it happens because there's always this like a countervailing force that is pushing you towards like, no, like this is empathy. You're not empathy. This is entropy. You're fucked. Like you're getting older, you're falling apart. And so whenever you have those moments where you feel like unstuck in time, um, it sucks. It, su it, it sucks worse than if you just like, I love the, 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 the description of the eyes, like the, the, I like the idea that it would almost be wonderful to just be old and have old like calcified rock eyes that don't express emotion because then like the arc would be simple. The arc would be simple. You'd be old, you'd be dried up and worn out and you'd be ready to die. And it, But instead life is, and our perspective on time is so fucking complicated and that makes it more fucking painful. So anyway, that's a, fa it's a fantastic fucking poem. Um, also, that last poem is so fucking good. The subtweet poem is incredible because, and just like one of the poems that you read, I don't know if it was the last time or the time before that, it has an unbelievably effective pivot about midway through. It starts off really fantastic because you really get the sense that like I get when somebody unfollows me on Twitter or when somebody like makes a nasty reply to one of my tweets or something, we're like, 
you first like react to it as if they had said it to your face. And then you like, pro but then you process it like it's going on over the internet. And so you, you're you caught between like this motherfucker. And then on the other hand, like, no, this is the internet. This is fake. This is stupid. You have to act like it's fake and it's stupid. And that creates so much cognitive dissonance and you capture that cognitive dissonance really effective in the first past half of that poem. But, but the like spectral possession, the fact that it turns into a fucking ghost story where you're like trying to exist out in the real world with this person who you only know on Twitter. And you're trying to imagine yourself in like a, having like lived on the internet, trying to imagine yourself in like a real human space and you can only be a ghost and it's, you can only, oh my God, it's so fucking effective. Anyway, Kat, awesome shit as usual. Thanks so much. Thank you. I have to say, uh, as someone who took music lessons as a kid, that, uh, that line, every good boy does fine, but it's a problem. <laughs> 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 Back that whole poem, like with its musical, like the metronome and all the like musical timing references, the G staff, like right rap, wrapping around you and shit. That was really good. I really liked it. Thank you. Oh shit! I thought I was muted, and instead I just coughed really loudly. I'm sorry. Uh, but yeah, no, thank you, Rudy. Thank you, Cat. I um, that was awesome, and I. I apologize for failing to mute my mic, especially after I give a talk at the beginning of each of these about how you need to mute your mic. Uh, anyway, thank you, Kat. And Colton is up next. Hello. All right. Uh, is the link link in the chat right? The uh, I, I, I sent a last second Google Doc to, to y'all's uh, uh, Twitter oh. account. Let me check. Let me check and see if it's there. I can grab it. So how are you feeling, Colton? I know you were feeling a little under the weather last week, too. Yeah, the weather drop. Just like, you know, like, you know, when like you notice like the tire pressure alert goes off in your car because like the pressure change. Well, that was like my sinuses. So I had to adjust. But things have been really good. I had dinner with my family today because my job just likes to give me Fridays off now. Um and I had a steak and some Sicilian red wine. So I'm I'm like, like it might be nap time after fucking 930. I'm not going to lie. I'm so fucking tired, I'm tired as fuck. Um, so. Uh, I found the document and I put it in the chat. So you should be good. Oh, yeah. Know. All right. I'm seeing the little animals pop up. So, yeah, this poem uh, from last week for those that were here for that misery loves company. I just remember William talking about how. He used to listen to gangster music in the car with his parents. And at some point, William uh, will start playing with a slinky and like, fuck, fuck, I have a slinky. And I was supposed to bring it, but I don't have it. Um, but yeah, just to me, there it is. Fuck yeah, for those uh, only people that are in this MLC can see it. So, but yeah, um, I paired the those concepts with that book, uh, was it The Sorrows of Young Werther? And I read that book in like a really like difficult time in my life. And so I was like, what if it's that story? But instead of a guy rambling about women, it's like William listening to gangster music in the car, like with his sleepy and just like, like the, like, like weird, absurd, sad, shocking things that go on in childhood, like the shit I normally write. So I'll go ahead and get into it. The splendor of young William playing with his slinky and listening to gangster rap in his parents' car to Texas, midnight, lacune, adolescent amnesia, Sloppy symbols, P, comma, Q, seasonal sinus infection. Can I have an A to B with you real fast? That man is a tank of productivity. He's up my gut, though, for sure. Yeah, but you ever notice that he never really yells at the amigos? Man, sometimes I'd give my right nut just to not know English anymore. Ding dong ditching the old man with Parkinson's. When you start foeing up so your girlfriend makes you a little puke basket and sets it on your side table less than three. Find David's hexagram. Buying six-pack pansies and baby bears at the abortion clinic pumpkin patch. Black flannel, Vince Guaraldi, small baby booze, milk glass decor, buckskin hybrids, USB charging blocks, Roman numeral three plus Roman numeral three equals Roman numeral six. Sly lip rich talking about how you should never trust anybody. 
Because once he blended up roasted garlic, put it in a storage container, and labeled it peanut butter. 300,160, Rudy. 23,590, 23, John. 8,190, Colt. 19,800, Brandon. Don't rush me now. Let me slip on my socks, eat my airplane cookies, and put in a new jewel pod. This new Memphis look is too fucking bird cap, so catered, smooth and rounded, not even grounded, just compounded colors filling in gaps and empty hold faces, slapped onto remastered places, no graces, all forms of life, forgetting about the hypostasis of the father and the swagger of Series 62s. It's all a fucking bother. Very true, Mr. Orange. Man, it makes me want to tag it up. Tear it up, scratch it up, jack it up, rip it up, and uncover hidden substances pouring out honesty and passion from where it all started. Um, well, visually speaking, 2010 to 2020 was the loudest decade on record, at least if you were online. $5 bowling alley my ties. Hey, friend, no line, no wait. Pin setter lowers 10 rednecks. You lob a two hole spin throw down a shined wooded carpet. Too much head there, Willie. After cleanup, mounted display screen shows us a uh, pterodactyl spare animation. Strike, 2-7, four spare. East, dith, north. Horn nuts. I can't feel God. No such thing as self-industry. Only rejection. Back to you. Similarity. Oh, hey, Venus, what's up? I stalked your blog and saw that you posted about how your mom used to beat you. Sepultura, dead embryonic cells. My folks moved here to sell dope, then they put me in foster care, lol. Depressing both flipper buttons changes line selector, free fall, stir, 1981. Yellow regurgitation bubbling with grass blades, still undigested. Closing one nostril in preparation for a Tennessee hanky. Items and trash will be deleted forever after 30 days. Hill blocks view of dead end. That's all I got. That was fucking great, Colton. I'm I'm glad I'm finally part of the Colton verse. Uh, Adam had, had already Adam and a uh, few others had already been immortalized, but I'm I'm glad to have finally made it. Here is the slinky for anyone watching at home. Um, I, <laughs> I love this piece, Colton. This is in some ways one of your more abstract pieces, but I really appreciate that since it's a piece about adolescence. I love the way that it so your pieces are often deconstructive right it's often like bits and pieces of dialogue moments in time what i love about this piece though is that it's even more abstracted out uh than many of your other pieces like the moments in time go by quicker there's less less explanation and context given and that's so fucking good for a piece about adolescence because adolescence is 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 fucking like that right it's all of these unprocessed moments some of them traumatic some of them beautiful some of them incomprehensible even though they leave a strong emotional residue right and i love the final line here the hill blocks view of dead end that is a, like what a perfect um like brief one ca sentence encapsulation of like adolescence right there like the this moment where like all of this energy and all of this beauty and all of this meaning like totally obstructs the fact that everything afterwards is 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 fucking is fucking nothing basically <laughs> yeah. nothing, just like you say right and it and superficially that's a really sad thing right superficially that's extremely depressing but but like you can't you that hill is beautiful right and in some ways it's better to have the view of the hill than the view of the dead end it's better to have go through adolescence seeing what you think is in front of you instead of what actually fucking is uh, anyway, it's really this is really well done, and of course, as usual, the incorporation of pinball elements and other game elements is one hundred percent fucking on point here. So, anyway, great piece, man. Thank you. Thank you, William. I fucking love pinball. Uh, and yeah, childhood like for me, it's just so weird because it's just like the weirdest, most specific shit I'll just remember. And you know, I'm like, why did my brain pick that? 
like you know and i like i have control over my brain right like i can do stuff but then it's just like remember when you fucking drew this really awesome marker picture and you were trying to describe it to your teacher and you sounded like you were autistic you know like remember that time and i'll never never understand but uh i'm i've been looking at this artist uh a guy that inspired bastiat uh Cy twombly i i don't know if i'm saying his name right but just the way that like like i was looking at his paintings and the way he incorporates art and uh like taking different poems and just like like scratching it out and deciding like what to keep what to leave out like i don't know it's inspirational it's inspirational as shit and just i don't know also all of the pieces that were read tonight all the authors i mean y'all are always i mean every mlc just inspiring not only me but everybody else i mean it's i don't know it's a good thing we got going and it's just a hodgepodge internet cesspool of fucking crazy lit and it's awesome dude this is awesome uh the score is in the or i think their score is anyway on the second page are those is that what that is or some kind of like <laughs> so <laughs> yeah like, I uh that those were scores from a pinball tournament and I just replaced okay. some names but like ma mainly it was just you Rudy because there was a John and a Brandon uh but yeah I got oh. fucking I got fucking last I got my ass whooped <laughs> yeah but I like there's I like the pinball references uh, obviously um and I like that X uh two underscore so you know the shape uh you know where you put the notation and stuff in there too and then you start the next line with the east diff north north this fucking but there's a line in there um depressing both flipper buttons changes line selector that one uh is really cool i because i i, I looked up the game like, like the free fall or whatever mm -hmm. and i just i was looking at what is line selector is that like the fucking shit that's scrolling like the text and stuff that's scrolling on the thing so on the play field, there's like a tic-tac-toe, like three by three, and there's drop targets associated with those lights. And the yeah. flipper will change this red arrow that goes line by line. And so it's mm -hmm. like you hold up a flipper and then you flip one and the line will go. And so like the ball goes up and like if the red arrow is on the bottom line and you hit all those drop targets, oh. then that row will fill. And so you still have the top two. And so you have to like switch it. It's like the craziest bullshit like <laughs> nerd math you have to do in your head while also trying to like like fuck physics you know like trying to play pinball right. it's crazy no, like trying to play during a tournament is insane like you have to be dialed in so hard playing that game it's it's ridiculous i like that mashup of that plus like this is like a random thought that you're having like the like you mentioned like random autistic thoughts like just coming in. it's like <laughs> Because I get that exact same thing too, and but the way that line and the way, like it's physically on the page, like you know where that line is the longest, the next one is a little shorter, the next one is shorter. So I was wondering about the line selector thing for that, but that's cool. I like that. Love it, man. Thank you, Rudy. And before I go, I have to explain a Tennessee hanky is when you cover one nostril and you blow out all the snot out the other one and usually you do it like out in the open just while you're on a walk and you just do it like no shame but i don't know i kind of reserve myself just doing it in my bathroom but it's really it's i don't know it's like it's funny it's really yeah like uh I'm finally i have a term name. for that yeah. i didn't See, know that's the... a specific slang term for that and of course it's a tennessee hanky what what else could it possibly be <laughs> See, it's it's called many things, but to me, like Tennessee mm -hmm. hanky, because it implies like something so formal that it's just like you fucking blow it out of someone's shoe. You know, it's so funny. <laughs> well, thank you, Colton. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Really. Say... Thank, you, thank you, everyone for the for the compliments and everybody in the chat. Everyone, everyone's awesome. It's funny you mentioned Cy Twombly because that's a really appropriate uh, point of comparison for your piece because of all. So there's this cliche that I usually take umbrage at about when people are talking about abstract expressionists, when they're like, oh, it looks like a child drew that, you know, and, and as a big fan of abstract expressionism, I always get really pissed off. But actually, Twombly is one of the rare, rare exceptions where that's actually fairly true, but by intent, which is that, like, if you look at some of his pieces, they'll either have, like, the... um they'll look like a child like testing crayons on a on a paper or they'll have like a like very primitive like cave drawing 
aesthetic, you know, and it, it's like the, there was an artist who he was an artist who was like very consciously dabbling in our ideas about like prim primitive art and our ideas of like the kind of art a child would produce, like naive art. And they, so anyway, it's a really appropriate comparison, even though I'm rambling. But anyway, thank you, Colton. Um, <laughs> um, and closing out the night tonight, unless I miss someone, is John, Johnny Hollywood, Hollywood. Jo where are you, John? Are you, are you Johnny New York now? You're not Johnny Hollywood I, anymore. I don't You're know. Johnny I'm Brooklyn. In... You're Johnny Dime Square. I'm in Michigan right now. It doesn't oh, okay. even fucking You're in my matter. fucking room. What the fuck? <laughs> I'm always in your room. <laughs> I'm always here. Uh, do I have my... Uh, yeah, we got to kick it back to the original. I don't, I don't want to be in William's room no more. Um, no offense, Tell Will. me about it. <laughs> um, so I got a long piece. Um, and you guys are stuck with me. And you have to listen to it. Um, all right. Uh, Mary's buried in the backyard of a house her parents built in the 50s. It was modest, but it was all they needed for a family. And one day when both Mary's parents woke up dead, it would go to one of the kids. And it was important to keep it in the family because they built it together. Lee, the father, was a bricklayer. The family on both sides worked construction, roofing, cement, something, whatever, Whenever there was time to sit on the porch, play cards, eat a sandwich bullshit, there was time to work, do tile work in the bathroom. Come on, just until the banana bread's out of the oven, all right? And, you know, there's talk around here of glow-in-the-dark people. You boys believe that? The sheriff says to that to three identical sunglasses, navy jackets and parted blonde haircuts, Tanner, Brad, and Henry. He wasn't sure which was which, so he never referred to them directly. All around town, we get these calls, little faces late at night poking out behind trees, all black eyes like a dog's. The agents spend the day unloading satellite dishes and monitors from the box truck they drove up in. It's dusk now. Hey, you boys hungry? I could take you three to Gleaners. Too much setup to finish. Can't leave until finish. Not allowed to leave until we finish. So the sheriff orders Chinese takeout from the bottom of the hill. Everything's at the bottom of the hill from up here. And he... Um, and he spreads out boxes full of rice and chicken, beef, broccoli, noodles, all across the conference table. Soup's on. He loads his plate full and takes a seat like Christ for communion, but instead uh, of them all sitting around him, they don't. They come in one at a time, scoop coffee mugs into rice and chicken and beef, broccoli, grab a fork and walk around uh, back over to their work. One comes, then the second, third, and then another, and another again. His first guess isn't that they're coming in for seconds. His first guess is the damn spooks are multiplying. So he gets up and walks around the place to make sure his station isn't overrun with blonde haircuts. It isn't. And now the sheriff is standing next to the least busy looking agent. Henry? Maybe. Now, you boys understand what I'm saying, right? Little green men, flying saucers, that sort of thing. Is that why they sent you boys up here? Henry looks up at the sheriff, and the only thing the sheriff sees is his own fat face reflected back at him in the blonde man's sunglasses. And while Henry uh, stays straight-lipped, an agent across the room, Brad, does the talking for him. Come on, sheriff. You're not some sort of crackpot, are you? And from further across the station, Tanner says, you believe everything you read in the tabloids, you retard? Henry, still looking up blank at the sheriff, splits his face open into a grin, big white horse teeth spotted with broccoli, and all three agents bark the same laugh at the sheriff. Things slow down after most of it's done. Uh, what's going on with the carpet upstairs? You finished the bedrooms? Lee stands up from the table. His wife's brothers from the next town over come by for dinner and coffee. Not that coffee is an additional thing. Coffee is an assumed thing. Lee says no. Don't worry about it. And stacks up the dirty dishes. Come on, we'll knock it out real quick. You do enough. You work. You come here. You work. Build nearly half the house. House, it's too much. Relax. It's beautiful out. Let's sit on the porch. Leon stacks white plastic chairs and drags them across the brick patio into place. Lee's wife, Sue, comes out with a pot of coffee, and him and her and all her brothers sit around, watching the sun go down. So, you two having kids or what? Sue scolds him. Jimmy, what kind of question is that? Mom wants to know is all. So what? Mom wants to know. Are you on mom's payroll now? Sue's brother, Johnny, says, yeah, basically, that's what happens when you don't move out. They spend all night gossiping. 
You're like a yappy old woman, Jim. Everyone laughs except Jim, who feels warm. It's just conversation, all right? That's conversation, says Lee, not, oh, how was your day or weather's nice, isn't it? You think asking your sister about the kind of sex we're having is conversation. You want us to describe it? Jim's chair scrapes hard against the brick when he stands. Jimmy, sit down, says Johnny. Jim does. Keep it light, huh? Look at you. You're all red. Maybe you're spending, maybe you are spending too much time with mom. What do you want me to do? Relax, relax. Light, Jimmy. We're teasing you. Yeah, I realize. Why do you think I'm getting upset? Lee grabs the coffee pot and warms up Jim's cup. Listen, tell mom we're trying. Fingers crossed. We'll pass along the news as soon as we get it, all right? Then Lee fills his own cup. Now, what about you? You going to find yourself a nice girl? You know me. I have my prospects. Had, says Joe, the tallest brother. You had prospects. They run away when he brings them home to mom. Uh, she means well, says Sue, and they all laugh at the idea. Ah, oh, little Jimmy, they say, imitating mom. My little baby, my little baby boy. Oh, don't grow up, Jimmy. Be mama's little boy for a little longer. Jesus, all right, says Jim. So, how's this weather? Nice, right? Worst weather I've ever seen, says Joe. Um, all right. From the top of the hill, everything looks like a miniature, and all the passing cars look like you could kick them away. It's the last obstacle on the long walk to the sea, aside from the walk down, and the higher they climb, the lower the sun crushes into the sand. Chest against the asphalt, holding heads up in their hands, they make like they're lying in bed on top of the hill and watch the sun go down, and they feel the heat drain away with it. Miles of flypapers stuck up in the air fall down into big, easy purple, and the moths, bats, fireflies, birds, and worms are free to fly and kick and squirm all around in front of them. Free and naked from the day's caked on mud, the clean and cold makes them want to roll around on top of each other. And the sun is gone. After the sun is gone, the two are quiet for a long time, staring down the hill, waiting for the point where nighttime couldn't get any darker. And when the moon's all the way up in the sky, Razorblade says, you ever roll down hills when you were little? Of course, says Jellybean. We had these big hills right outside the back of our elementary school, and everybody would roll down it. You'd race and see who could roll down the fastest. And you had to roll like a log, though, you know? We had recess ladies who were watching, and they said it was fine to go down like a log, but you weren't allowed to do somersaults or anything fancy. You'd get in trouble. And it always hurt your neck when I did it different anyway. Razor, si Razor Blade sits up, brings her knees into her chest, and looks down. Feels the cuts healed smooth along her legs like speed bumps. She can't remember the last time she scraped her knees. I want to roll down this hill. There's traffic at the bottom. Will you roll down this hill with me? I'll race you to the bottom. Yeah? You think you can beat me? Oh, yeah, I know I can. No one rolls like I do. Jelly Bean takes her eyes off the road and looks to Razor Blade. She's magnetic. Uh, she feels herself rolling towards her, and she does. Rolls all the way until she's on top of her. I think it'd be a lot more fun to roll down together, though. They wrap their arms around each other and almost roll all the way down. And although a fall from all the way up from there would kill them, they really almost do it. Uh, the adults hang around the kitchen, fall asleep on the couch, spend the rest of the day leaning back in lawn chairs on the back porch, sweating through their church pants, casual shirts, eating birthday cake, watching fireworks, kids on their laps, kids in the yard, running through sprinklers, jumping in leaves. Kids too young to read sneak off to pick flowers for their mothers, and Sue cries each time an anemone is ripped from her daughter's burial garden. Here, Grandma, I picked these for you. Sue reaches out to the little hand and smiles, holds the flower close against her chest. Thank you, sweetie. For the past 12 years, it's been Lee's job to crouch down and say, Jelly Bean, it hurts Grandma's feelings when you pick those flowers. He takes her hand and they walk to the garden. You see that big rock in the ground? Yeah. Can you read it? Um, yeah. Okay, let's read it together. All right? Okay. Lee leads and Jelly Bean chants behind him. Mary, Be Mary Medina in loving memory, 1958 to 1986. That's my name. Who is that? That's your aunt. Oh, where is she? She's dead. She's buried there. He points at their feet. Jelly Bean jumps back like all the other kids do. Eyes go big. Hair stands up. First, they're shocked and scared, and their minds jump to zombies reaching up, dragging them down into the dirt for being disrespectful little boys and girls. And some kids scream and run away. Others freeze, waiting for the ghoul until the fear fades and they're left feeling empty. Either way, they end up in tears like Jelly Bean does, and she cries for the rest of the party. Her mom's chair scratches against the porch. Uh-oh, sounds like the little one's cranky. Lee peeks up Jelly Bean. 
Hey, it's okay. It's okay. Why is she dead? He hands her off to mom and she rocks her. You want to take a nap? No. Shh, shh. Okay, let's go inside, okay? Hours later when the party's over, Jellybean sneaks out to the front yard and picks handfuls of dandelions until her arms are full. She knows her parents are looking for her, so she sneaks through the kitchen out to the backyard. Hey, Aunt Mary, she says to the flowers. I'm sorry you died. Sorry for picking your flowers and crying. I got you these ones. And the dandelion bouquet springs out everywhere when she opens her arm. This is, oops, sorry. She gathered them all up in a pile by the headstone. Uh, the sliding door opens. Her dad's calling now, so she knows it's seriously time to leave. Okay, I gotta go. Love you, and I promise to bring you more flowers. But she doesn't because she's only three and very forgetful, and she probably won't remember a single minute of what happened today. Um, this is very long. Uh, do you have a warm heart? She asked, but she meant, do you have worms in your heart like I do? It was a first date. It was an AA meeting, but they weren't alcoholics. Jelly Bean was crying in a bathroom stall when Razor Blade walked in. They didn't know each other, and they didn't know it was their first date. A public bathroom is at its brightest at night. During the day, the janitors sometimes choose to leave the lights off. But by midnight, the bulbs are warmed up and buzzing at their full potential. A public bathroom is always too cold. It's no place for blankets. You can't get comfortable in a public bathroom. Not with the buzzing and the cold and the sterile tile, sometimes wet. Someone walking in at any moment, the American public bathroom is the mixed up love child of a hospital and a prison. On their first date, they don't comfort each other in the bathroom. They comfort her, the, each other in each other's arms. Aw. I'm sorry, says Jellybean. My hands are so cold. It's okay, says Razorblade. I'm overheating all the time. The sheriff keeps hanging around in doorways 10 minutes at a time, hours after it was supposed to be quitting time. Tanner, Brad, and Henry pretend not to notice, but it actually bothers them a lot. Hey, which motel did you boys say you'd be staying at again? We didn't tell you we'd be staying at a hotel. Oh, huh. Must have just thought I asked then. So what hotel they put you boys in? We're not staying at any hotels. We're staying at the station. Not allowed to leave until finished. The sheriff scans around the pile of boxes. Well, damn, I hope you boys brought some cots because we're not exactly equipped to, slip three, to sleep three guests. We'll make do. I'm sure you will. He walks up behind one of them. Well, you boys need any help setting up some sleep quarters? Huh. Looks interesting. All three snap their heads over to the sheriff. No, it doesn't. They sit back, smile, smooth their hair. Hey, Sheriff, says one of them. It's pretty late. Why don't you go home? The Sheriff grabs a half wall and stretches his back. No way in hell I'm leaving you three nuts alone in my station. Ah, uh, that's all right. I'm used to staying up late. All those calls about flashing eyes, speaking in tongues, makes the townspeople comfortable when they can reach me uh, here at night. Oh, that's very persistent of you, Sheriff. Yep. And he adds, I try. One of them lets out a big yawn. Wow, I'm going to go smoke a cigarette. Let me step outside. I'll be right back. He walks through the door, around the corner, pulls out a cell phone and dials. The station phone rings. The sheriff hustles over to the front desk. Cook County Sheriff, what's the emergency? Really? All right, you stay inside. What's the address? He scribbles it down. Okay. 435 Oriole. Got it. Be there in 10. Stay inside. He slams the phone down. Hey, boys, I got to run. He jogs through the doors. Hops in his police truck and peels down the hill. You do that, Sheriff. That one guy, Brad, comes back inside. He's gone? Yeah. Um, good. And he locks the door behind him with chains and padlocks. They sit down. Click open three identical briefcases and pull out three identical envelopes. They place them on their laps and stick out their hands. Rock, paper, scissors. Tanner loses, so he swaps his sunglasses for readers. All right, let's see. Today's subject is lovely Mary Medina, 1958 to 1986, backyard burial. Will states Mary will be reburied next to her parents after they croak. Okay, let's see. The fact that she's currently buried in a backyard means there's virtually no graveyard interference, which makes her a prime candidate for this trial. Tanner flips through the pages, skims. Uh, yeah. Standard equipment, everything else, boilerplate. Yep, okay, good luck, have fun, sign the government. All right, well, let's get to it then. It takes about 15 minutes to tear through and set up everything in place. There's 12 small satellite dishes set up in a circle around the station. 
all pointed at one large satellite dish pointing straight up. The central dish has a long antenna, some sort of metal fishbowl running through it, and two pulleys that lift and flip the bowl along the antenna. The contraption is connected through hundreds of wires and tubes to another contraption. One that looks like a human-shaped bottle, six feet tall, standing on a metal base and made entirely out of glass. They set up their monitors and keyboards and go to work. On the monitors, a signal comes through, a voice, and with some fine-tuning, the satellites dilate, and the voice becomes clearer and clearer. You can totally hear it. You can totally hear it. You can totally hear it. Comes a woman's voice through heavy static. Is that it? Tanner reads through the government papers, compares the audio signal on screen to the examples on paper. It would seem so. Wow, that was quick. Yeah, damn, that was fast. Who wants to be on fishing duty? I'll do it, says one of them. It's kind of fun. Maybe it's Henry. He walks over to the big dish and grabs a hold of the pulley cables. He tugs one, and the metal bowl creeps up along the antenna. You can totally hear it. Something inside the bowl glows blue, and the higher he raises it, the brighter it glows. When it's almost at the top, the blue light nearly spills out of the top. He yanks the other cable. You can totally, the bull flips over. He lets go of the raising cable and the bull crashes against the dish. Slam fires the blue light through cables and tubes. And now there's a tiny swimming glow floating against the top of the glass mannequin's head. You're getting good at that. Thank you. Uh, can I feel your hair, says Jellybean. Only if I could feel yours. Walking down the hill, all the houses stand at attention, pressed against the front lines with each story stacked almost on top of each other. I like the way your hair feels, says Razor Blade, both hands buried deep in Jellybean's newly orange hair. I like the way your feels I like the way yours feels too. It feels like mine, says Jellybean, running her hands all over Razor Blade's head. We have the same hair. We should dye it the same color. Yeah, and everyone will think we're sisters, or in a band, but we'll know the truth that we can't sing or play any instruments. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm a great singer, sings Razor Blade badly. They're both wearing Frankenstein's boot, Frankenstein boots, and they smack hard against the pavement. Uh, what about you? You roll down hills at school? At school? Not really, says Razor Blade. My school was on flat ground. We had a loading dock and we'd jump off. Razor Blade's quiet. She thinks about how many times she's hit the ground and it feels like a lot. Uh, I should jump off this hill. From this high up, you die. Yeah. There's no traffic at the bottom. Cars stopped passing by a half hour ago. It's a clear night. The stars are out. Uh, well, if you jump, then I'll have to jump with you. Just promise uh, we won't land on our teeth, okay? Razor Blade learned to read the stars she learned online. Okay, says Razor Blade. Here, says Jellybean. She puts her hand over Razor Blade's mouth. I'll protect your teeth and you protect mine and we'll both be safe. Jellybean feels a smile under the, her palm, then her mouth's covered it with razor blades, and uh, they walk down the hill, neither saying anything because they can't, but about a block down, they sense what the other's thinking. At the same time, they lick each other's palms and giggle uh, and repeat the process 10 times, trying to guess when the other will do it, not wanting to lick too early. Somehow they can feel it before it happens. Tiny sparks, and that's how you know when they sparkle. On the fifth time, Razor Blade licks and Jelly Bean bites. Ow, you bitch. The last block down the hill is a foot race. Razor Blade running and Jelly Bean running away. At the bottom, Razor Blade tackles her to the ground, sits on top of her, snatches her wrist and bites. Ow, ow, are you giving me a wait, are you giving me a hickey? Jelly Bean breaks out of the bite. You freak. Hey, you know what time it is? Jelly Bean looks at the bite mark rich uh, watch in the middle of her wrist. Oh my god, you're such a geek. Yeah, I know what time it is. It's time for me to bite you into your butt. Uh, razor Blade pops up and runs before Jellybean can snatch her. No, no way. We're even. Jellybean chases. Um, all right. Last night of summer. Uh, last day of school. Last night on Earth. Good night, all. A disco ball spaceship lifts her half uh, way in her sleep. Uh the inside's all mother of pearl, even the captain's seat, even the steering wheel. Everything's sticky, burnt heroin, and pixie, pixie sticks. On the way up, she kisses the world's forehead goodnight. And only at night, I see her reflected in the windows by light of stars millions of miles away from me. And she comes to me naked, floating, skin shimmering, shining in the dark. Waterfalls without rapids, obscured underwater, she comes. 
She comes in fits, hot nights, bad sleep. She comes to comfort. She comes as soft as velvet. Lightning crashes as glowing constellations cool before my eyes, and she comes in tears down my face. Blurring roads into silent rivers and traffic signals into Christmas lights. And why should the world look so pretty when she's gone? Because tears smear the world into old Impressionist paintings and because grief is proof of love. And every stranger, before they walk through the door, before they turn around, can always be her. And as long as I don't know, I can always believe. No, no, don't turn around. Let me pretend. And it's all fuzz, warm carpet in front of the TV. The street is my house. The middle of the road is my home. Home is a public bathroom, 30 minutes at a time. The world is my house at 3 a.m. There's nobody around to tell me otherwise. And it goes on for miles and miles, and it's an old farm and an oil change and a broken up corn silo and a diner with the windows boarded up. And I am miles and miles and miles of empty cornfields, and sleep comes wherever I lay my head. Um, and I'm going to skip this part because I don't want to read it. Uh, and then down here, Jelly Bean's parents were in the process of packing up everything. Listing the house and driving across the country to sit down furniture in an empty house on the West Coast. It would have been a lot for little Jelly Bean to handle. So she spends a few weeks at her grandparents' house. Lee and Sue are happy to spend time with their granddaughter. Every day they go to the park and sometimes they go to all the little stores in town. And at night they play go fish. And Lee never lets Jelly Bean win, but most of the time she does anyway. Why are you so good at this? I've played cards all my life and I've never won so much as you. Lee was genuinely unaware that Sue was sliding cards to Jelly Bean under the table. The nights always ended with Jelly Bean and Lee staying up watching old cowboy movies, usually Clint Eastwood. Lee didn't care for the Duke. Why does Grandma go to bed so early? She gets up early. For work? Huh. Yeah, right. No, she goes to the beach. Beach? I want to go. Yeah? You'd have to wake up real early. Like, really, really early. I can do that. All right, I'll wake you up. But that means you'll have to go to bed right now. Oh, okay. Sue's alarm goes off at 4 a.m. She slides out of bed into the bathroom. Lee fights to stay awake. Ah. Uh, he stretches big. Sue. She doesn't hear him. Knowing he has to get out of bed, he says, darn it. And rolls out of the cupboards. Sue, he says, shuffling into the bathroom. What? Jelly Bean wants to go to the beach with you. You want her along? Oh, says Sue. Yeah, that'd be nice. I'll go wake her. You can go to bed. He's already in bed. Yeah, okay, God bless. And he's snoring. Sue goes to Jelly Bean's room. Hey, Bean. She rubs the girl's shoulders uh, until she stirs awake. Grandma says you want to go to the beach with me. Or Grandpa. <laughs> Jelly Bean's half asleep. Yeah. Okay, let's get you dressed and get going. They eat muffins on the drive, and the sun isn't close to up when they get there. Feels like nighttime. Yeah, it does. Why are you here so early? I'll show you. They walk along the shore, looking at all the little shells that wash up until they come across a massive conch that must have just washed up. Sue sits down by the shell. Jellybean goes to pick it up, and Sue stops her. Wait, don't touch it. Sit over here. Jellybean does so. Okay. You know how if you put big enough shells to your ear, you can hear the ocean? Jelly beans nods. This is kind of like that, but different. When it's real early in the morning, like it is now, and shells have just washed up and nobody's touched them, sometimes in big enough shells, you can hear little pieces of old conversations. What? How? Well, words are kind of like magic. They're full of energy. And what happens is after you speak words with uh, good energy, like when you talk to a friend you really like, all the good energy is free and floats up into space. And every now and then, as it's floating around up there, it gets bounced back down to Earth by a comet or a satellite or something. And when those words get bounced back down, they can get trapped under certain things, like these seashells. And when we turn them over, we can hear the words one more time as they float back up into space. But won't they go away again? Can you keep them if you just put them like in a jar or something? No, Bean. Good energy shouldn't be trapped. It wants to float back up into the sky. That's where their home is. If you bottle them away, then you keep good energy from being in the universe. Oh, Jelly Bean buries her hands in the sand. You ready? Yeah. Okay, here we go. They put their ears close down to the shell. Sue flips it over and out from the deep, and out from deep within exits a woman's voice. 500 Americans die every year from falling out of bed. Yes, it's true. 
I learned it on a website that tries to get people to not be afraid of flying. I'm not afraid of flying, but I went on a website. 500 Americans. Just think about that. It's going to be old people and then like messy people or like frail people. Did you know I'm on blood thinners right now? If you like punch me and I bled, I would die. Jellybean picked up the shell and tried looking inside it, but couldn't find anything unusual. Oh my gosh, where'd those come from? I wasn't kidding, Bean. Who was that? Do you know them? Those words? No clue. Could have been anyone. All I know is they were talking to a friend. Uh, must have been a weird conversation. Sue laughs, stands up and brushes the sand off her pants. Yeah, that was kind of silly. Jellybean and Sue walk down the coast, looking for more big shells until the sun rises. At daybreak, they call it and walk back to the car and get on with their day. You do this every day? Yep, favorite way to start the morning. You ever hear anything from anyone you know? No, but I'd like to. Can I do this every day with you? Of course you can, but you won't be able to stay up late with Grandpa every night then. Oh, shoot. How about every other day? So you can still watch movies and look for shells with me. Yeah, let's do that. Jellybean stays with her grandparents for another week. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Jellybean goes to the beach with her grandma and stays up late watching cowboy movies with grandpa. And on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, she catches up on sleep. On Sunday, her parents pick her up, put her on a plane, and aside from phone calls on holidays and birthdays, Jellybean doesn't see Grandpa Lee and Grandma Sue until their funerals a few years later. Every now and then, the sheriff goes out for dinner alone. He's decided to try this place called Giorgio's, a place he thought was Italian, but turned out to be Georgian. He already knows what he wants, a steak. A waitress runs up to him. He finds her terrifying. She has the body of a circle, short spike hair, lemur eyes, wide open, and eyelashes that spike out. She's standing way too close to him, and the idea of her brushing her long eyelashes against him fills him with the same disgust he'd feel from a massive moth flapping its wings against his skin. She opens her mouth, and he's struck by how bad her breath smells. Hello, honey, she says, and the sheriff nearly gags. Before he could stop her, she starts reading the specials. Tonight, we have halibut served with mashed potatoes and uh, asparagus, and that comes with house salad. She's smiling like an idiot. The sheriff wonders if he's done something to upset this waitress or the owners of this restaurant because she's too close to his face, blowing rotten tooth funk into his face. His appetite's gone, but still, he orders a steak out of politeness. The steak comes, she breathes more stink into his face. The sheriff tries his best to hold his breath while making it look like he's not. The steak is disappointing, and he's not sure if it's because of the waitress's breath or because of mediocre cooks but it's probably a combination of both. It's bland, covered in cold sauce that doesn't even taste particularly good, came from the kitchen that way. Without the sauce, a flavorless steak might have been okay, but the cold sauce ruined it. The sheriff only ate half. It wasn't cheap. It wasn't a cheap restaurant either. With every bite, he was reminded that he spent a full hour's pay on this, an hour of his life spent for no reason. He would have preferred just dropping the money down a well rather than eating this steak. At least he wouldn't feel so fucking stupid. It was so upsetting to him. When the waitress ran over to ask if he'd like dessert, he just said, no, check. This happened a few days ago. And in spite of everything that's been going on, the strange reports, the government spooks capped out in the station, and even the current situation he was driving to, still, when he got in his car and let his muscle memory carry out the habit of driving, he found that the night of bad steak and terrible breath had wafted back into his head. And now he was feeling a bit sick. Serve and protect, but the sheriff knows, unconsciously, that he would not respond to any calls from Giorgio's. And he secretly wished for something terrible to happen to that restaurant and that waitress. Not because the sheriff was a bad person, but because deep down everyone has secret fantasies of unreasonable cruelty against people who annoy you. Fucking steak. Fucking bitch. Clint Eastwood's hiding on top of a bell tower. A group of outlaws search the town for him. Robert Duval's men. A goon walks over to the bell tower, circles around the perimeter, but never looks up. Clint watches the goon. The camera leans over with him when Clean leans over each side, watching the goon round corner after corner. The goon stops at the front door. 
turns and looks over the town. He strikes a match against his boot and lights a cigarette. Clint lifts a clay pot, a uh, water pot over the edge, drops it. It crashes square against the goon's head, knocks him out cold. Clint lights a cigar, squints, and says through the corner of his mouth, looks like quite the headache. Lee spits his coffee out and laughs so hard he can't breathe. It's so early in the morning by the time they get to the beach that it feels like nighttime still. They've taken their Frankenstein boots off, walk hand in hand on the shoreline. The water's warm and it washes up to their ankles. Tears burn my eyes, can still feel the sea salt in my hair. My hospital's demolished, my churches down in flame, and my home with you has been taken away. The number of highway exits shrink to zero. I can still hear the waves crash, tears burn my eyes, and sleep comes whenever I crash my car. Razor blades face down, writhing on the beach, tears in her eyes, crushing sand between her fingers. All Jelly Bean can do is hold her. Tell her she's right here. She'll always be here. She takes her face out of the sand and buries it in Jelly Bean's shoulder. You're not going to slip away from me, not tonight. I've got you in my arms. It's okay. It's all right. Months later, Jelly Bean sits at her grave. Je Razor Blade walks up, wearing a trench coat and hat talking in a gruff tone. Hey, kid, why are you crying about? Jelly Bean jumps up and squeezes the hidden razor blade. She explains that she faked her own death. They don't have to worry about the past. They're free to be together now. No, she doesn't. Jelly Bean cries. But now they're still walking down the beach, whispering how much they love each other and do their ears. You're more perfect than $300. You're more perfect than $400. You're more perfect than $500. More perfect than $500? You really think so? Yeah, even more perfect than that. And they skip through the sea foam, kicking it all up in their wake, slipping pretty seashells into each other's back pockets, jingling like Christmas bells. Jellybean spots a big conch on the beach. Razor blade, come here. The two girls lean against each other, sitting by the shell. My grandma once told me, when I was really young, in big enough seashells, you can hear pieces of old conversations bounce forever in space off a hundred different satellites. Really? Says Razor blade. Let's flip it over. Maybe some ghost has something to say to us. They both reach out, turn the shell over, and out comes a fragment of a loving conversation. And the voice that speaks is unfamiliar, but nostalgic. It makes her think of a flower garden, meticulously kept with anemones everywhere. A tidal wave hits LA. Jellybean and Razorblade dye their hair matching pink. Everyone thinks they're in a band. They make like beach boys and surf down Sunset Boulevard, Boulevard on matching Hello Kitty boards. Capitol Records, Sunset Tower, crumble against crashing waves. On the beach, her and Razor Blade find a discarded beach towel to fall asleep under uh, with the rising sun. Jelly Bean squeezes Razor Blade tight and whispers into her ear, you make me feel like a little kid picking dandelions. That was wonderful, John. That was really fucking wonderful. It's, a, it's definitely... One of your, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, fucking cough. Man, I really adore this piece. It's so fucking bittersweet, but it's full of so much intrigue. And there are so many like subtle, magical realist elements that it's never overwhelmed by any one emotion, right? It never becomes too saccharine. It never becomes too absorbed in grief and loss and sadness instead you you really walk this very cautious emotional tightrope between you know bitterness and sweetness between grief and the joy of being alive and it's it's a beautiful piece john it is just a really beautiful piece it's meticulously constructed i love how there's another version of this piece that's just about jelly bean and razor blade and doesn't include the sheriff and the like weird agents trying to use satellites to conjure the dead and all of those other elements and i think that version of the piece is much worse than this one i love all that like twin peaks strangeness all the like surreal stuff like really i think enhances the emo like expands the emotional palette of this piece. I love the bit with the sheriff at the diner because there, because it's almost like the opposite of a palate cleanser, right? It's a reminder of like the 
pettiness and and ugliness and nastiness of life in a piece that's otherwise very interested in like big emotions and like in as I said in like loss and grief but also in like romance and love and affection and and you know the family bonds and all of that and it's just it's a wonderful piece, John. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks. Ramona says the steak lady is real. Is the steak lady is real? I, that <laughs> that happened to me. I'm very. I'm still pissed about it. Oh no, okay. John! I'm sorry. <laughs> that part is that. really, really oh, fucking awesome. Where you talk about the fantasies like you will have of just killing someone because they made some little like thing or whatever, like like they did something like some some trespass that like only they could experience or whatever yeah i mean it's it's a very little she was a nice enough waitress but i fucking hate her (laughs) yeah because she ruined something that should have been nice right and those are always the like the stuff people do that they're like the the small cruelties that people engage in that they're not fully cognizant of are always the fucking worst because you're not allowed to say anything in the moment, right? Because if it was a situation where someone was just a fucking dick to you, you can just like flip them off and then you're like, yeah, like, and then it's like even, right? Somebody was a dick and you retaliated. It's the moments where you just kind of have to let someone be a dick to you either because like, of social norms or weird power imbalances and shit or just because like you're aware of the fact that they're not trying to be a dick to you those moments are the fucking worst because what can you do like you just have to live with them forever (laughs) i mean yeah that was a big because it was like she was really like kind and like had a lot of like energy she was very nice but it was just like the worst smelling breath I've ever experienced when you're away that's like kind of contrary to the job right you would think that like oral hygiene would be a pretty (laughs) important part of being a waiter or a waitress (laughs) I'd rather she was just like I'd much rather she be mean to me but have good breath yeah um yeah and then um I I'm not I don't take credit for I I love the names jelly bean and razor blade I didn't that's from a error story that i really like so i ripped it off i stole I think it. you read that story here actually now that you yeah. mentioned it yeah but uh it's a very sweet story i've always loved that one so yeah. i wanted to yeah yeah, yeah the, the, like the supernatural and like the weird elements it reminds me of like one of those like like uh william mentioned magical realist and almost like upstream color or something like that yeah where the, natural elements like frame the well well not frame but kind of provide like a background for the emotional stuff going on and stuff it's, i really like that the scenario because it reminds me of like a very surreal type of 90s for some reason twin peaks was mentioned i won't mention that so it's very <laughs> it's it's really cool yeah it, it's hard to- I wasn't even going for Twin Peaks, but like when you talk about just a sheriff station on a hill, it's like that that just kind of, that's just Twin Peaks. <laughs> right. All right, John. I'm gonna end this now because I have to run to the bathroom. Um, but thank you for reading, John. And thank you to everyone who read tonight. This is a bunch of really great pieces. There it feels like uh, another one of those greatest hits nights when like a bunch of the regulars come together and read their best shit. And I really, I really enjoyed it. So anyway, thank you to everyone who read. We're going to end this here. We do this every Friday night, 8 PM Eastern time, 5 PM Pacific. Anyone is welcome to come and read their work. Anyone is welcome to come and join us and just hang out. If you would like to, we tweet out the link to the zoom meeting, a few minutes in advance, usually from our Twitter account at Misery Tourism. And that's fucking it, guys. Thanks so much. We're going to end it there.